So um, hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Ashley from Performance Optimal Health, and I'm just going to act as moderator today for our first installment of Couch to Competition uh, webinar series. This first one's just focusing on lacrosse athletes in particular, um, kind of a special interest of both Shane and Dr. Sethi here. So uh, I will kind of turn it over to Dr. Sethi first, just kind of introduce himself and, you know, tell us about his background a little bit. And then Shane, I'll have you introduce yourself and then I'll kind of throw it up for questions. Ashley, thank you very much. Uh, I'm, I'm, my name is Paul Sethi. I'm a sports medicine and orthopedic surgeon uh, in Greenwich at, o, at ONS. And I've been here for about 17 years. I'm really excited. Uh, over the years, I've we've treated uh, athletes with performance and Shane has looked after many of my athletes over the years. So I think the synergy here is, is exciting. Um, I do focus and one of my one of the things I get most excited about is the ability to return to sport, uh, the, the ability to return to sport safely and without injury. Uh, my disclosures are I'm not a lacrosse player. I was a wrestler uh, in, in high school and college, but I have three of them uh, that live in my house, these lacrosse players. Uh, so they, they challenge me personally. And at the same time, I look after after many lacrosse athletes, both collegiate national champions, actually last year, some of my patients and um, and, you know, I'm the coach. Get this right. I'm the coach of the kindergarten and first grade team at the Greenwich Youth Athletics Lacrosse Team. So Amazing. that's me. And uh, I'm Shane Foley. I'm a physical therapist, um, board certified in orthopedics out of Greenwich, Connecticut. Been working with Dr. Sethi, as he said, for a number of years now. Uh, my disclosure is I am a collegiate lacrosse player or ex collegiate lacrosse player. So I played at St. John's University and Sacred Heart University. Um, so I've known the sport well, being a player, coached it for many years, and now kind of taken my off-field uh, expertise as a physical therapist and working with athletes and still have, you know, a little, a little love for the game and a niche with the lacrosse players. Great. Well, thanks, you guys, for joining us. Um, I think this is a great way to kind of kick off the series. So overall, for you guys listening out there today, we're just going to focus on participation in lacrosse. We'll start probably with some injuries, kind of what you guys are seeing clinically you know, in the office, um, and then we'll move into just general participation in lacrosse and kind of what we look for, what kids can be doing to prevent injury, um, you know, not just wait till they get injured. So, I mean, we're probably, what, a week into the season, tryouts are pretty much going on or done around town. So anything that you guys are already seeing just one week in, either certain injuries or types of injuries or, you know, uh, based on competition level or age, so Shane gets to see probably 50% of the injuries that I see as I'll send them over to him. But at just a week or 10 days into it, I guess I can start out with an, two ACL tears, ankle sprain, hamstring sprain, um, groin strain, uh, compartment, exertional compartment syndrome. And in, in, in my friend's daughter, freshman uh, lacrosse player, stress fracture, the first metatarsal. That was so you're today. not busy at all. That, that's that's this week. Um, <laughs> what else, Dan? What else have you gotten recently? Yeah, I mean, well, last weekend was the first real opening of tryouts, and I was in the gym working out and didn't even get to finish my workout with four phone calls from parents, all different lacrosse things. Um, a fracture of tib fib. I had two ACL phone calls and um, a hamstring strain. So things are happening. They're happening pretty quick. I mean, look. now. Uh, sorry, Ashley. I, I no, just, no, you're I, fine. I, I was just going to say, is this is this typical? Like, are these injuries something that you guys expect for the beginning of lacrosse season, or is is this something to do with the fact that like kids haven't been participating? So the answer is yes, at least in my opinion. To that, um, it, look, every every year in the beginning of a season, we see some of the less conditioned or deconditioned athletes who are going to come in and roll their ankles and and have their hamstrings get really inflamed. I think this year represents a special situation because we have such a compressed season. So a, a really a shortened preseason and, and an, an accelerated rate to game and play and anxiety. And I don't mean anxiety in a bad way, but sort of like a internal pressure for all of us to sort of have those releases back for our youth athletes. So I think we do have a little bit of a higher, a higher stress point or injury point that perhaps we don't have the same preseason preparation and, and the ability to be in the gym and training in, in the off season has really been uh, disrupted too. And, and Shane, I think you can touch into a bunch of that. Yeah. I think it's, um, it's kind of a combination of deconditioning because of the pandemic and things being shut down. Plus 
just an increase in enthusiasm and people waiting to get back out on the field. And when that first thing that happens is not practice and preseason warmups, then you're going right back into a competitive level level and you're going back at 110%. So I, I think I agree with you. It's just you're going back too quick, too fast, missing a step beforehand. So as you know, as, as I think about this, I always want to think about, well, gosh, someone tells me this is happening. What are the practical takeaways that I could get? You know, if I'm a parent listening in on this or I'm an athlete listening in, well, look, I'm going to preach at the choir and say to you that in the preseason, you should have been right. Well, look, that happened. So I, I think we can we can go over the importance of preseason. But I guess it's really talking about now in season, in season minimization of injury. And how do you feel, Shane, about in season lifting? Um, I think it's something that you need to do. And I think, but smartly, I think that when you're looking at like, how do you prepare to become a well-developed athlete injury or not, that really there's a continuum of things that you need to do. And the first thing is just general physical preparedness. And that's just like getting into the gym, getting back into exercise and getting into like aerobic conditioning before you start to do anything that's too like sport specific. Like if you want to try and work on improving your 40 time and speed or your bench press, or your squat, you need just a baseline and a foundation to build upon before you start layering those things on. So <clears throat> my point being, when you're going throughout the season, you need to make sure that that general physical preparedness still exists. You're not going to be able to push it to the max, but you should still be able to maintain and build a foundation. And how do you reconcile some of these athletes, especially the high school ones? And I, I'm going to, my daughter will be mortified if I mention her name at all. So I'll, I'll do my best. I did it two or three times. But how do you reconcile being a, a, a teen or a middle school athlete and having now, now you and I are saying, listen, you should be lifting. Well, well, hello. When do you fit in lifting between games, practice and actually being a student, which seems to matter? Yeah, it's um, well, it's trying to make a schedule. Making a plan is going to be the biggest thing, right? Because if you're going from nothing to high level of competition, you're going to get fatigued out. You're most likely going to be a little bit deconditioned. So you're going to need to plan in when you're going to be lifting, what your nutrition looks like when you're recovering. So when you look at your weekly schedule, the same way you look at your homework schedule and when you're going to get that stuff done, when are you going to get to the gym? When are you going to have an intense day of practice or tryouts? And then what does your recovery look like on that off day? And are you truly taking an off day so that way you can bounce back the next week and perform the way that you should be? Yeah, so you guys, can we take a little days. step back for a second? Please. When you guys are talking about this in-season preparedness and being ready to lift and perform and participate in practice games, school, all of this stuff, this stuff you're talking about, Shane, and correct me if I'm wrong, is not like a week before the season, right? We're talking about laying the foundation for months to years in advance. Can you guys talk a little bit about like, okay, say I'm only a lacrosse player, I only play a spring sport, or I am also a basketball player, or I played soccer in the fall, and how do you kind of work in through the seasons preparing up for, you know, their spring lacrosse season? Yeah. Uh, I, the way I look at it is, so if you only play lacrosse and you really, and whether you play it one season a year or whether you're playing it every season, it's just that when you're in that in-season mode or that most competitive season that you're in, you have your, you have your general training and then you have your specific training. And if you're looking at just one season and the spectrum of that season, that in the beginning of the season, general training should far exceed the specific training. As you get towards the end of that season where you're talking about getting into more competition and tournaments, going for a championship or something like that, the specific training and the intensity of that specific training should outweigh that general training. So just trying to periodize your season in such a way that there's some kind of growth and development and it's not just a flat line the whole way or it's not too quick of a ramp up into it. I mean, I think that's spot on. And to use the word periodize is, is sort of very unique because people who lift weights will understand or train, understand periodization of your training. But periodization of your season is also important because the truth is you don't want to peak in your first three weeks of your season. You don't want that to be your best performance. You want your performance to progressively enhance. So Ashley, you touch on sort of the, you know, the impossibility of this, right? The bottom line is that you have to prepare and you have to strength train. You have to get your neuromuscular things set in place before you start to try out because you're not going to, it's very hard to get stronger in season. You can get slicker and your stick skills can get better, um, but you, you get faster out of season uh, and you maintain it in season. Yeah. And I think 
training more and training harder is not necessarily going to lead to better outcomes. It's like having a smart plan where you're looking at what's the intensity of the training that you're doing on a daily and weekly basis. And what's the volume of training that you're doing that like, truthfully, if you're going from your GYL practice to your tryouts for your select team after it, and then you're doing that four days in a row, you're not going to be able to perform if you're not doing the things like And I think you're froze. Well, I think you're back there, Shane. Did I cut out? Yeah, just repeat that last part. All right, sorry. <laughs> I was just saying that if you're, when you're looking at this and if you have, if you're trying out for GYL one day and then you have your practice for your select team the next day, you have to look at the total volume and the intensity of what you're doing each day and each week too. That if the volume is too high, then you have to do something to recover for the volume. And if the intensity is very high, you have to do something to recover from the intensity. And that if both are very high, you have to be doing something to keep yourself at baseline so you can continue to perform. Otherwise it's gonna be too much too quick. And then as you touched on one of the subjects that, you know, it's a sore subject among, among all of us who take care of athletes, but the pressure to specialize in sport or sports specialization at progressively younger ages, right? If you don't play for my fall team, then you're never going to make my spring team. And, and it's really a dilemma. And the coaches want to develop the athletes as best as they can. And the world is getting progressively more competitive. But what we know for sure from a medical standpoint, and, and I want to use this as a parlay into like some, some sort of hard direct evidence. But what we know for sure is that early sports specialization is associated with higher levels of injury and higher rates of surgery. So, the, the athlete who learns how to be a really good point guard or to defend on the basketball court is going to end up having a higher sports IQ in their lacrosse and or soccer than that athlete who only is on that one sport. And they're going to have a lower risk of uh, injury, a lower risk of burnout. And, and finally, you know, while only 6% of athletes are going to go on to play college level sports, college coaches really prefer and enjoy the athlete who's more than a single sport athlete. Yeah, I, I think additionally to that too, it, coming off of a winter sport, if you come off of playing basketball and you're going into lacrosse season, like that basketball season was part of that physical preparedness that prepares you for lacrosse. So having this last winter too, where there wasn't much going on or limited capacity does make it a little bit tougher, but I agree with you. It makes better athletes too. They're just. So the two things I want to sort of, sort of flesh out, or maybe three things. Shane, I, I want to think about like one, how can we prevent hamstring injuries? Two, how can we reduce ankle sprains? And then three, how can we, if we think you can, reduce the risk of ACLs? Because those people who are listening on the phone, like those are the things that we don't want to hear. Hamstring is going to jam you up for a couple of weeks. Ankle, you know, I, I'm not going to talk about my daughter. Ha ha, I got you. She knocked her ankle out in her first week of tryouts, which was really, you know, very devastating to her because look, this is when she wants to try and show her stuff. So first tell me about hamstrings. Yeah. And the way I look at hamstrings is the things that are going to predispose you for injuring your hamstrings is having lower aerobic endurance and lower anaerobic capacity. And what I mean by that is aerobic endurance is thinking about, can you go out for a longer distance run and have the endurance to be successful in doing so and not be out of shape training to build up to that anaerobic is like that quick change of direction change of speed first you need to have your base aerobic and then start training in sprint intervals and some kind of drills for change of direction other elements that come into it for me is like muscle tissue flexibility and then also the strength of the hamstring too so have you done some kind of just general strengthening to make sure that you're strong so one of the exercises, I read a paper just about six months ago that looked at uh, eccentric hamstring, sort of that, that Bulgarian or, ham, or Russian hamstring exercise. It's unbelievably torturous and painful, but where your colleague or your teammate or your trainer is holding onto your ankles and you slowly fall forward trying to resist that. And that's been shown to, to decrease the risk of, of hamstring injury in season. So that might be something practical to put your hands on. Um, and then hamstring strengthening, particularly uh, in, in our female athletes, you know, as I sort of now, if I move over to, to ACLs, which, you know, it's a, sort of the thing that we never want to talk about, but there's no question about real data that says that there are training programs that our young women and men can do that will reduce the risk, not eliminate, right? Sometimes it just happens, 
But um, Shane, do you have any quick and dirties on that for or, or guidance for people? Yeah, I mean, factors that you know, factors need to work in your training program is controlling landing mechanics. So, can you control your hip landing over your knee, landing over your ankle? Do you have aspects of dynamic balance? So, when you're doing different kind of sport specific things, are you can you and anticipate things? Can you react to different things? Do you have good rotational control? A lot of these injuries that you probably see, Dr. Sethi, right? It's, it's a injury where not many people are no ways around you on the field. You plant, you cut, you pivot, you lose control and the ACL snaps. So additionally to that, core strength is going to be huge. Glute strength is going to be huge. Quad strength is going to be huge. So those are my three big things there. So the lacrosse federation and the soccer federation has sort of put out some of these programs that are available in a line and they take about 15 or 20 minutes and they can be part of your pre warm up. The, the easy one, if you want to look is called the FIFA 11 plus. And while not, none of these are the gospel and the answer, at least they're simple online uh, and, and free resources to try and just get, get each of us thinking about exactly what Shane just said. We've got to, you have to have explosive strength, you have to have landing ability. Your knees have to not buckle in when you land. Uh, we tend to want to really overextend our legs when keeping a little bit of a bent angle, maybe even better for when you run and get faster. So those are, those are some of the important things. And then Shane, what about, how do I not roll my ankle? Yeah. Um, kind of similar type things, right? The, the risk factors in, that I see with ankle sprains outside of the fact that if you had a sprained ankle before you're at an increased risk of spraining it again. So if you're one of those people that has sprained your ankle, even more emphasis on doing it is really just what is your muscle reaction time, which is something that you can start training with some of the things we we're already talking about. How do you look in control with your postural sway? Are you falling outside of your base of support and controlling your body? And have you gotten into some just like baseline athletic conditioning? Those are, those are factors I look at. What are your thoughts? I mean, that, that's it. It's just, look, it, 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 the, the perturbation or sort of getting up on that little b b BOSU ball or some sort of imbalance and having, you know, your teammates sort of bump into you or push you and, and you stabilize those small things, those small micro motions and talking about, you know, if we really get nerdy about it, we can talk about how your muscles twitch and they can twitch fast or a little slow and more contractile and, and teaching your body to use, take advantage of both of those things, I think are huge. Yeah. And I like, what are your thoughts on this too? I look at, so like, those are all the factors, like risk factors of injury, but if you're doing those things, I, I truthfully think it's going to help you to be a more successful athlete, right? The way we're talking about lacrosse, how you're going to generate power in your shot or make a cross field pass. If you don't have rotational control and you don't have the core strength in order to do it, you're going to be trying to push pull with your arms and you're not going to make it, you're not going to increase your velocity. So if we can work in all these factors into your in-season training program, yeah, it controls the risk factor of some kind of injury, but it's also going to help you perform better on the field too. I mean, I think you're totally right. I got a pivot question for you. So, you know, I talked about my three lacrosse athletes in my house. My middle guy is 12. Every single practice I'm at, someone asked me, well, listen, when do they start lifting, right? When is a safe age to be in lifting weights for, for these athletes? So uh, I have my own feeling. I'm going to ask you and then I'll pipe in. What do you think? Yeah, I think in middle school, the biggest thing you can start with is just like your ABCs, just like your, your agility, balance, and coordination. If you have those down, then starting to layer in body weight type exercises. If you can control your body weight with good form, then that's when you can start to load it. And that's, I mean, I truthfully mean that with anybody. If you don't have good control of your body, there's no way you should be adding weight to it because you can't control that movement pattern. As somebody is still growing and their growth plates are open, like resistance is variable. So it doesn't have to be weight that is the medium of resistance, but using some kind of elastic band to challenge them a little bit in different planes of motion can work middle school going into high school. If I had to put a hard number to it, I would say probably like your freshman going into sophomore year, as long as you have good advisement on how to do it to start lifting some kind of weights or start adding some resistance is probably fair. Yeah, you know, a couple of years ago, the American Academy of Pediatrics put out a statement that they didn't think weightlifting was very safe in the youth athlete. Uh, and, and as a consequence, there's a lot of data that, that came out that said, actually, that's far from true. Resistance training is totally safe. It will not prematurely close your, gro close your growth plates. Um, that doesn't mean my six-year-old should be on the bench press, you know, not even close. 
So without a stable foundation, it is absolutely uh, a, a setup for injury, right? Without a stable mechanics. So I think that you're right. Look, body weight stuff, body weight, walking lunges and side lunges and squats, uh, and then learning, learning some explosive things. So I, I love things like box jumps, but then just as important, coming down off the box and really controlling it, that learning that quick, quick explosion. That's where you gain some strength. So I think you can train, you can train safely. And it, it, it's probably uh, a misconception that you can't resist and train, but it has to be at, based on, on an appropriate pyramid uh, and supervised. You can't just send them all into the gym by themselves sure. unless you want some broken toes. Yeah, I agree. Somebody said to me the other day that kettlebells hurt people. Uh, well, kettlebell is just an inanimate object. It's not going to hurt anybody if it's just sitting there. It's what you do with that kettlebell that may hurt you. So if you can control your body weight and you can do those things that you were talking about, that's when you can start to then progress those to the next level. So, so a quick pivot, and Ashley, you're going to have more questions for us. But you, you at one point, Shane, had worked, worked up a great plan. We talked about what to eat before football games, right? And we sort of thought about, hey, what do you want to have night before what do you want to have day of and how do you want to maximize your nutrition? Uh, because we, we, I think most athletes are going to accept that their body is a temple and what you put in, put in good, you know, you'll get out good and, and put in garbage and don't expect a lot out. Are there any sort of with, with a different sort of endurance type sport here where you're running, you know, for, for close to two hours, what are your, what is your advice on, on pregame nutrition and hydration? Yeah. Uh, I mean, the low hanging fruit there is hydration. I think that you need to be hydrated. You need to be drinking 48 hours before your competition. You need to be ensuring that you're, you're hydrated and that you're taking in enough water. If we're talking about food, I think I grew up in the, the world of pasta parties on the night before a game and you'd eat as much pasta and you know chicken parm as you could the night before. And then you feel lethargic the next day. I think if you look at what's going on in the world of nutrition now, we're kind of getting away from that. Carbohydrates are good because they break down into sugars, which is energy that your body needs. But something that's a little bit leaner in, in the fact that it's kind of the way I think about it is something that grows in the ground or you could farm in your backyard. You want to have a well-balanced meal as opposed to just a carbohydrate dense. So if you can go have a portion of rice, portion of some kind of vegetable and probably a majority of that being protein, then you're going to have a well-balanced meal that where you're ready to play and you're prepared to play. I think getting away from the carbo loading actually allows you to uh, succeed a little bit more. And then, and then on hydration, you know, the general rule of thumb that, that I, I look at is before participation, before your game, plain old water is probably the right answer. And, and most kids now are going to have their water bottle with them, right? So if you bring in a 36 ounce water bottle, you should say, look, my goal from morning until participation is to drink that water. Once you get to the half and that, that evening, then you can switch over to the replenishment because, you know, pre-participation, you don't need that sugar to slow you down. But then halftime and, and sort of post-participation, you can replenish and maybe enjoy some of those drinks that aren't as entirely healthy. And, and the things that are high in sugar, really, you should avoid. But the, the reduced sugar and the fun taste, we don't have to ruin all sports and take away all the Gatorade. Yeah, or dilute it, right? Yeah. That's what I used to do. I mean, some of those Gatorades are just too sweet for me personally to taste. And it's when you look at how much sugar is in it, you need more water than you actually need the sugar. So dilute it, 50-50. Ashley, what else do you have on your list that we're supposed to hash through? <laughs> yeah, I do have a couple questions, some tangents based on what you guys are talking about. Um, and if anybody listening does have questions, there is a question and answer feature. So if you pop them on there to me, I can read them out loud to these guys. Um, first thing is you guys talked about the importance of strength training, the importance of nutrition, and then Shane, you brought up the importance of recovery. Can you go into a little bit of what you mean, whether that's in season, post game, post practice or, or out of season? Yeah. So the way I look at recovery is kind of twofold. I look at like micro recovery and macro recovery. Micro is the things that we started talking about. It's hydration. It's that, are you getting enough water and are you consistently getting enough water? Are you getting enough sleep and what, and are you on a consistent sleep schedule? And in order to do that, you know, making sure you're going to bed at the same time each night or roundabout in some kind of range. Are you doing some kind of mobility work that as you're out and playing and competing specifically, you're, 
using your muscles, your muscles are going to go through a lactic state afterwards and they're going to get tight. You need to make sure that you preserve your mobility so you're ready to perform the next day. And then like Dr. Sethi just said, that you're doing something to maintain your nutrition. When you're coming off the field, the first thing you want to do is eat. It's going to be even better for you if what that first thing that goes into your mouth is something that's nutritious and gives your body the fuel that you have just depleted in playing. Then from the macro level, <clears throat> when we're talking about sports and performance and things like that, I look at outside of this, when you have your day off, that you're doing something that truly gives you that dopamine response that really is relaxation and fun. That lacrosse is fun. Lacrosse was the thing that I love to do but something else that allows you to have different kind of fun that's just truly relaxing. And then that when you're going through high levels of competition and tryouts, there's an, a, there's an aspect of stress and fear avoidance and things like that that come in and just some kind of way just to kind of separate yourself away from the sport. Like we're talking about with over-specialization in youth athletes, that can you step away and can you just really have a moment to yourself and or just visualize success on the field, I think is important. So kind of looking at like micro being like, what can you, I do in my day to day? And then macro, when I'm looking at my week, you know, am I in a shooting slump and I'm getting frustrated? Okay. Can I do some kind of visualization techniques where I see myself being successful? That's going to help me recover. That's going to decrease my stress on the field. That's going to help improve my performance, things like that. What do you think, Seth? I mean, look, that, that's it, right? I, I like how you break it down. First of all, sleep. Teenagers just with the challenges of homework, with their sleep cycle, and with some of the pressure to go to school so early, which has been slightly adjusted. Uh, I think sleep is, you know, eight hours of sleep is, is way underrated as an important component of physical and mental recovery. Um, we talked about hydration and we talked about proper diet. And then, uh, like I said, a lot of this is baked in, right? And this is sort of the, the challenge of this talk. What do I mean? I mean, that like what you did for the three months that led up to this season is going to bake into to what you expect out of the active season. Yeah. Uh, we do have a question in the chat, which actually kind of leads me back to the other direction I wanted to take this. Um, somebody asked, is there any correlation between artificial turf and sports injuries? So that's a challenging question. You know, a decade ago, we would have said, no, not at all. I think that the, and, and turf is not turf, right? As, as all, as, as parents and as athletes, you recognize you're going to play on four different turfs and one will be like a, a shortcut cement floor and the other one will be a long full grassy sort of feel. So the interface between your shoe and the playing surface is probably what we're shooting at the most. And if the shoe grabs too hard on the turf, which is the risk, which is the greater risk in turf rather than grass, then you're at a higher risk for sort of accelerating around your ankle and or knee. So, so the wrong shoe turf interface, I think can be dangerous. So that's an example of like an extrinsic risk factor, right? And what were you guys have been focused on this whole time is an intrinsic risk factor. So can you, can you guys expand upon that a little bit? Well, Shane, intrinsic I'll, let, risk, uh, intrinsic? Uh, Sh Shane I'll let you take it a little bit, but you know, I, I really want to focus on sort of the, the, how do you get out of those things, right? Because intrinsically by being a young woman, you know, I have a daughter who plays, and again, she's going to love that I mentioned her, uh, soccer and lacrosse, right? Those are the two single most sports where young women tear their ACLs. So weak quads, weak hamstrings, less ideal landing. I think those are ways we, we can sort of identify, fix, and work on. But, you know, extrinsically trying to have, you know, and it's not really egalitarian or fair, but you probably need more than one pair of shoes to play sports on, depending upon the surface that you're playing on. Ooh. Yeah. Yeah, I, I mean, I would agree. And just knowing what the situation that you're going into is and knowing that what if you have AstroTurf, that you should be wearing turfs. If you're and what the studs look like, too, we have molded studs, we have quarter inch studs, half inch studs, three quarter inch studs, which truthfully in this sport of lacrosse, I think we should stay away from. Because uh, to your point, I think it just increases that risk of uh, contact and interface too much. All right. So now you say you're injured, you have XYZ injury. And then you have the athlete who says, I'm ready to play. I feel fine. I'm good to go. And then you have the athlete that says, I'm not sure. What if I get hurt again? How do you guys each manage that from your own perspective? What are things you're looking for to say, yes, you're ready. No, you're not. And how do you have those discussions kind of between you two? And then also with the, the athlete. You must've seen my email to Shane uh, yesterday. It was <laughs> exactly that. Right. And it, it, both situations exist. I mean, Look, the, the, the easy one is when the athlete is ready and, and you and the therapist feel that they're not. 
we've gone far away from simple tests, like saying if you can hop on one leg and simple tests on the doctor or therapist saying, hey, I think you're okay, because they're not really objective and they're not that helpful to the patient. And what, and what you know, we've worked with in concert uh, over the last couple of years is, is the return to sport test, right? And you take that test and you take it the first time and you fail on purpose, right? And, and what that does is it says, look, I need to work on X, Y, and Z. And I need to score a 90 on this return to sport test such that I'm then released. And then the athlete and the therapist and the surgeon are all really aligned in the goals and the goals are, are completely transparent. And I think that, you know, you set that from the beginning and, and five years ago, I don't know that we talked about this this much. Um, and these tests aren't perfect and you can still get re-injured afterwards, but they're currently the best thing that we have in terms of helping them get back to sport objectively with goal setting and with an appropriate time sequence. Yeah. And I think I look at all athletes from what their end goal is and then try and reverse engineer that program. So the ACL is easy to talk about because it's a longer timeline, but if their goal is to get back to sport by a certain time, or just to get back to sport period, I look at what that case of care is going to look like. And that, that return to sport test is not something that happens at the end. There's multiple levels of criteria that they have to hit in order to keep hitting those milestones to move forward. So whether you're coming in with an ankle sprain and you want to get back out on the field and it's a, it's a much shorter window to get back out, or it's an ACL and it's going to be a matter of months to a year, then it's something that's going to take meeting criteria to say, I have enough clinical confidence and I have enough surgical confidence from Dr. Sethi that it's good for you to go back out on the field you're not timid, you're not fearful to go back out on the field. And you have confidence that if I gave you clearance, that you could go out and play 100% today. And then the confidence part, actually, look, you know, uh, the, the smaller injuries are still substantial, they still weigh in your head, right? And you don't, when, when we let you back to sport after ankle sprain three weeks later, or, or 15 days later, gosh, the athlete's still aware, There's, they still feel a little bit. So it's somehow keeping them diligent into making sure that their neuromuscular patterns are firing, they're continuing to work with their trainer or therapist, you know, uh, before and after practice, uh, and, and maintaining so that you're not just back in the same spot, worse off three, four weeks later. Uh, and, and what's between our ears is a huge factor in, in, in performance and, and psychological readiness. I mean, look, part of Part of the batteries of tests that we give people are and involves psychological readiness. Yeah. And that's one of, I mean, you can weigh in on this is one of the biggest risk factors of somebody, even that's testing objectively strong and in control of their body, huge risk factor of re-injury is just that fear avoidance. Would you agree? Yeah, it's, it's absolutely part of it and sort of transitioning someone in. So when we're doing a rapid return, uh, it, it can become challenging for, for everybody. And, you, you know, you say, gosh, that athlete looks tentative. Could only be in their shoes and know why, you know, an unbelievable athlete who's, got, who's fearless of other things looks tentative. That, that says a lot. Yeah. So, like, I use that clinically. And I've been an athlete and come off of injuries. And it's like, if you know, if, if the only test you have is that test right before you're cleared to go back, that's the only thing you have to say that you're confident. Whereas if you're passing tests throughout and you have a plan to build up to it, you're building up that confidence throughout. You're setting short-term goals for yourself to see successes. So that way, by the time that comes around, you're ready to hit the ground running. Uh, that's it. That's, it's, it's so hard and so true. All right. Those are the questions I had. Um, I'm going to open it up to the participants if they have any last minute questions that they want to put in the chat. But I'd like you two to kind of summarize, like, what are your takeaways, right? Like, what do you most want people listening to this to know and, and to kind of get out of this? For me, I want you to really take your preseason seriously. That's your time to get stronger, to get faster, and set the base of your pyramid. The second thing is that I want you in season not to forget to do your strength training. It doesn't have to be at the same level, but you want to do maintenance. And then the third part of that pyramid that I want to emphasize is the appropriateness of sleep and nutrition, treating your body like a temple, because the combination of these things can't eliminate all of our injuries, but can really reduce the risk. Yeah. My take home biggest thing would be have a plan. Look at how many teams you're playing on, how many days a week you are participating in practice or game. And what are you doing on those days when you're not playing? Are you resting, recovering? Are you doing a little bit of exercise and some strength training, resistance training, or some mobility work to recover? And then I think outside of that, um, 
it's really just keeping up with everything that we said that when we're looking at the risk factors of injury, I look at those risk factors of injury as also things that will set you up to improve your performance in sport and become a better athlete. So taking those things seriously, and even if you're not injured, using those things because it's going to prevent or as best we can prevent injury in the future and optimize the performance that you can achieve. Perfect. And that sounds like a good summary. Um, if you guys have any other last minute thoughts, otherwise I think this was great and super informative for everyone. Um, I'm really excited to kind of get this out to the community and then just start educating people. Thank, Thank you, you guys both so much for being on this, um, our inaugural, uh, first webinar here. So I think it was great. Um, and I really appreciate you guys being on it. Appreciate the opportunity. Thank you. Everyone have a great season.